Hello, I'm John Allure. Before you listen to this episode, a couple of things. These are podcasts from the first season of Who Killed Teresa? They haven't been heard in over four years. They're raw. It took me a while to develop a style. A lot of people like them that way, unvarnished. Others commented that it was amateurish. Nonetheless, here they are, unedited. I haven't gone back and listened to them. I haven't cleaned them up. Thanks for listening. And once again, life isn't fair. Justice is blind and dysfunctional. And some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. This is Who Killed Teresa. Who Killed Teresa? I'm your host, John Allure. It's a podcast where life isn't fair. Justice is blind and dysfunctional, and some cops aren't smart and dedicated like on television. Teresa Allure was a 19-year-old Canadian college student who disappeared on Friday, November 3, 1978 from Champlain College, Lennoxville, in the eastern townships of Quebec. Five months later, on April 13, 1979, her body was discovered in a small body of water approximately one kilometer from her dormitory residence in Compton, Quebec. Upon her disappearance, police initially suggested she was a runaway. When her body was discovered, police then suggested that she was the possible victim of a drug overdose, perhaps with the assistance of fellow college students. In the summer of 2002, the family of Teresa Lore enlisted the support of an investigative reporter and friend, Patricia Pearson, who produced a series of articles for Canada's National Post newspaper that presented compelling evidence that Teresa Lore was a victim of murder and that her death was possibly linked to two other unsolved local cases, the death of 10-year-old Manon Dubé in March 1978 and the murder of Louise Camerin in 1977. The theory was supported by geographic profiler and FBI consultant Kim Rosmo, who suggested a serial sexual predator may have been operating in the Quebec region in the late 1970s and advised police to investigate the three deaths as a series. Rosmo later gained notoriety when, in 1998, he suggested the Vancouver police create a serial killer task force to investigate the multiple cases of missing women from Vancouver's downtown east side. Robert Picton was eventually arrested and found guilty of six murders though he was accused of and implicated in an additional 26 murders of Vancouver missing women. The deaths of Teresa Lore, Manon Dubé, and Louise Cameron remain unsolved cold cases. The investigation continues, and 15 unsolved murders from 1975 to 1981 have been geographically identified as possibly being associated with the original three cases. And the 15 additional cases are Sharon Pryor, Lee Choquette, Louise Camerin, Jocelyn Houle, Chantelle Tremblay, Joanne Dorian, Helen Monast, Catherine Hawks, Denise Bazinet, Manon Dubé, Lise Blay, Theresa Allure, Nicole Goudreau, Tammy Leakey, and Joanne Lemieux. Um, Since last uh, podcasting, I believe it was on Friday, Good Friday of last week, and we talked about two unidentified um, victims, uh, one in Longueuil and and one near the Montreal airport, who had since been identified as uh, Joanne Lemieux and a woman named Maria Dolores Brava. Uh, Funnily enough, right after I published that podcast, I got a phone call from a police source in Quebec, and we were talking about these two cases, and uh, uh, they, um, in in the case of Maria Dolores Brava, recall that's the the woman who was found in a dumpster in a, in a box uh, near the Montreal airport, near the site of where Tammy Leakey's, 12-year-old Tammy Leakey's body was found. Now, my police source told me that 
he has looked at the file on that case and police believe that was not a homicide. They believe it was an act of criminal negligence, but that is as far as they were willing to go in that case. In the, in the other case, in the case of Joanne Lemieux, that's the woman who was found in 1977, a year, uh, two years and one day um, from the date that Sharon Pryor was found uh, at the same spot, Chemin de Lac uh, in Longueuil. The police uh, source confirmed to me that, uh, yes, that is being still investigated as a homicide. And uh, this source was from the Sûreté de Québec, and he said that they had been in contact with the Longueuil police and uh, had spoken about this case and had requested from Longay a copy of the file on Joanne Lemieux. Wouldn't go into details about what that was about or why the Sarté de Québec was looking at a case that was not in their docket, but nevertheless, that is the information that I was given. Loose ends. So I want to I want to add three remaining cases um, to the ones we've discussed, and then I'll, I'm going to attempt to summarize some things about them. Um, this, um, in a way, does mean that we come to a conclusion with this. Uh, these these cases, but uh, as somebody asked me the other day, they said, "Well, it, does that mean you're going to stop podcasting?" Far from it. There's lots of other things we can discuss. Um, and also um, new information always comes in, so the story changes. And I think after 38 to 40 years, you can always kind of reframe these things, see the narrative from different perspectives. I know that my, um, my thoughts on it shift and uh, kind of uh, percolate and change uh, as, as time passes. So I, I really don't have any intention of stopping and I'll stop when I have nothing left to say um, but anyway uh, the cases I'd like to add so the first one I'd like to talk about is uh, a case of a young woman named Lise Choquette and uh, Choquette um, lives in the east end of Montreal uh, and in April, on April 22nd, 1975, her body is found in Laval. Now, to give that a little perspective in terms of time and place, what that means, 75 should, should ring uh, familiar to you as the year that the Sharon Pryor case occurred. And East End should ring to you because that's, that's the area where there was, we have those cluster of cases involving Denise Bazinet disappearing um, from a street corner. Recall that she was the waitress at Saint Hubert Barbecue, found at Saint Jean Richelieu. Uh, that's also where Lise Amblay was um, uh, murdered in her backyard, stabbed. Um, and also the case of Jocelyn Houle disappearing uh, while a night out with friends um, at the Old Munich. In the case of Choquette, so this is April 22nd, uh, 75, uh, she, she, as I, I say, she, she lives in the East End, um, and her body is found in, in Laval. Uh, she's 30 years old, 5 foot 1 inches, 141 pounds. Uh, she's found beaten and strangled. There's no alcohol in her system. And she, um, she's been strangled with a necktie around her neck. A gray and black, uh, a gray tie with black circles, uh, and the label is Caporchichi. Clothing is found about uh, 200 feet away. She has no ID or jewelry, although police know that she was wearing a, a, a ring at the time of her disappearance. And uh, she lived at 2247 Rue uh, La Rivier which, um, funnily enough, is uh, it's of no consequence. It's of interest. That's one block away where the uh, Sarté de Québec's uh, headquarters are on Parthenay, near the Jacques-Cartier Bridge in uh, Montreal. 
and to kind of orient yourself. Where she lives is about a 10 minute drive from where Denise Bazinet and Lison Blay lived. Um, and again, the, the, case is, the case is never uh, solved. Where she's found in Laval is in a construction site. It's where they're, they're building, I, I believe it's the Auto Route 440, and that was under construction, and she's found by a construction worker there. Now, another case I want to kind of add on here, um, it, it's, it's merely a disappearance. We jump forward two years, June 27th, 1977, and a teenager by the name of Sylvie Doucette, five foot four inches, 120 pounds. She disappears from her home or near her home, which is 3634 uh, Rouen Street in Hochelaga. Hochelaga is the East End, but I'd say I'd put it at about 20 blocks further east from where the case we just talked about, where Lee Choquette lived. So again, we're getting this cluster of East End cases. And now the final case I want to add is the case of Nicole Goudreau. Goudreau is 31. She's five feet tall, 95 pounds. And on August 3rd, 1979, uh, she's found in a field about a block away from her residence at 2032 Rue Saint-André. She's found naked on her back, uh, raped, beaten. There's blood on the stairway leading up to her apartment, so police believe she was attacked there, then dragged in the back to the field uh, where she was sexually assaulted. Um, purse is found near the body. The purse is empty. And uh, she um, has multiple skull fractures. And the, the cause of death is strangulation. Um, and the case is uh, notable because um, this area of Montreal is uh, very near to the place where, uh, again, Jocelyn Houle had been um, out for a night with her friends at the um, Old Munich. It's also near the place where um, um, Catherine Hawks worked. Recall Catherine Hawks was the uh, woman who was commuting back. Uh, the, you normally took the train to her, her home in Cartierville, but this night, because there had been a blackout, took a bus and was attacked uh, in Cartierville. Anyway, Hawks worked near where uh, uh, Nikki Goudreau um, lived and, and died. So th those, those are the cases. Um, there are some other cases that um, are on my website that we will devote an episode to that I don't believe. I think they're isolated cases. They're not in any way... Um, um, associated um, in terms of crime with these cases. Um, however, they are associated in terms of being criminal investigative failures. Um, and um, for that reason, they're worth a discussion, a discussing because they, um, they shed some light. Um, they, they provide some, some perspective on, on what was going on in Quebec in the 1970s. But for now, given all that, uh, 15 cases, some, some missing person cases, which, you know, in the case of the missing persons, again, they inform things, but at this time, uh, we don't really know what happened. Perhaps the person um, came back home or is surviving and living somewhere else or living a perfectly happy life. We, we just don't have that information. So what I'd like to do now is to kind of walk through these um, I think finally it would be a good idea uh, to provide a timeline perspective, walk through them chronologically, and uh, give some um, some comments on, on what it what it all means. So from top to bottom, from seventy five to eighty one, what we're talking about here is bookended, beginning with Sharon Pryor in Longay, 
an ending with Tammy Leakey in 1981, also uh, disappearing from Longay. Again, as we said last episode, within blocks of each other, and, and sandwiched between those, we have we have these inc- all these incidents we've been talking about for 17 episodes. So again, we begin in 1975 um, with Sharon Pryor, who uh, disappeared from Point Saint Charles, f- found body found brutally murdered in uh, in Longay. Um, quite a chaotic, disorganized uh, crime site, although I would hardly call the offender disorganized, seemed highly organized um, and uh, methodical in, in, in plotting out the, the abduction and murder of Sharon. Next, we, uh, we move uh, 19 days later to the case of Lou, Louis Choquette, the case we just talked about. So 19 days later, April 20th, 1975, Choquette disappears from the east end of Montreal and winds up a few days later, if I recall, um, in Laval, the construction site um, where they're constructing a, an auto route, a highway, strangled with a necktie. We pause for about two years, and it's not until March 25th, 1977, that we have the case of Louise Camerin. And this is a case 100 miles away in the eastern townships. She disappears from from downtown uh, Sherbrooke, um, she's a military cadet, and she's found in the woods off uh, Chemin Guerre um, in 1977. And we're, we're looking at things we we talked an awful lot about, possibly a highway killer, Route 112. And what what connects prior to Cameron is that both are both cases. Um, the disappearance occurred adjacent to the, the same highway, uh, Highway 112, although um, with uh, at a distance of 100 miles apart. We then move to April 2nd, 1977, is the next case. So, um, possibly, uh, pro- uh, I mean, um, uh, just a week after the Camara case, and two years and a day from the Sharon Pryor case, the body of Joanne Lemieux is found in the exact same spot where Sharon Pryor was found on Chemin de Lac. I take that with a pound of salt when I say the exact same spot. I don't know that. I know they were both found in woods on Chemin de Lac. So um, I'll, I'll back off that statement a little bit. And we know uh, uh, that um, the cause of death in the uh, Joanne Lemieux case, um, it was ruled a homicide, but no specifics were given. But we do know that she was sexual, uh, sexually assaulted because sperm was found on the victim. We move to approximately two weeks after that incident in Longay um, to April 17th, 1977. And now we begin a real cluster, a real summer of disappearances in homicide in the Montreal era, in the area, beginning with Jocelyn Houle. Uh, she disappears um, out with friends at the old Munich. She's a nursing student. Recall that Louise Camara possibly also worked as a dental associate or as a nursing associate at the hospital up the street where she lived in Sherbrooke. Um, Houle disappears from the east end of Montreal um, and is found in saint Calix, which is north of Montreal. Um, Following that, we have a disappearance um, a month later, June 14th, 77, of uh, Joanne Dansereau. She goes missing from her home in Fabreville, um, followed by a woman uh, two weeks after that, June 27th, uh, Sylvie Doucette, from her home uh, in the East End on Rouen Street, um, in the Hochelaga region of the east end of Montreal. Um, ten days, two weeks later, July 9th, 1977, is the case of Joanne Dorian. Uh, again, we have Laval, Fabreville region. Recall that Dorian was a, a, a nurse or nursing student at the Cartierville Hospital. She's commuting home from the Cartierville Hospital 
Um, on the bus, she's last seen by the bus driver. She turns up a few blocks later on the water's edge. She's uh, the, the cause of death. Uh, is, the b body has been in such a state of uh, decomposition. They're not quite sure, but certainly a lot of trauma. And I bet she was stabbed as, as well. That's the case of um, uh, Jean d'Orléans. Uh, we skip then to Chantal Tremblay. Uh, this is uh, the young girl also um, from the, the Laval region who is commuting um, by, um, by bus to the metro station. She goes missing um, and her body is found uh, two years later, July 27th, 1977, because of this state it, near her home um, in Terrebonne in the Laval region because of this state of advanced decomposition. They don't know how she died, but her clothing is found adjacent to the body. And then we have, right after that, September 10th, 77, the case of Hel Helen uh, Monast, um, the, the young woman from the little town of uh, Chambly. Uh, it's her birthday. She leaves the pizza parlor where she's working about 11 o'clock at night. The next morning, her body is found uh, in the park adjacent to the pizza parlor. She's been strangled, um, clothing found next to the body, possibly strangled with a boot lace, uh, similar to the Louise Cameron case. September 20th, 10 days after Monast, 1977, the case of Catherine Hawks. We were just talking about this. The commuter who uh, on the night of the blackout uh, exited the bus, was attacked, uh, body left in the bushes, a caller phoned in, um, Appearing remorseful for the case, police failed to arrive uh, on the scene until 22 hours later. We know that Hawks was alive when the caller called in, um, and but as the uh, probably died in the night as a, a result of of her her wounds and being exposed to the uh, elements. To just kind of backtrack there, what I find interesting is. is in, in terms of time and place, the, the Dorian, Tremblay, um, Dansero, and Hawks cases all play out very, very quickly. Dazino from Laval, June 14th, 77. Um, Dorian, the Laval region, region, July 9th, 77. Chantel Tremblay, again, the Laval region, uh, July 29th, 77. And then finally, Hawks, September 20th, 1977. Not in a, a Laval um, a connection, but a Cartierville connection. She lived in Cartierville. Dorian worked in Cartierville. And Tremblay would have needed to, had to commute through Cartierville in order to take the, the bus from her home in Laval to the metro station where she was heading. October 23rd, 1977. So this is roughly a month after the Hawks case. We have Denise Bazinet. Again, Bazinet uh, works at a Saint-Hubert barbecue. She disappears uh, in the in broad daylight afternoon in the east end of Montreal. She winds up, winds up at the side of the road, uh, Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. She's been strangled. Uh, one shoe is on her foot, clothing scattered near the body. Location is just south of where, uh, the, um, just south of Helen Monast's case in Chambly. January 27th, 1978. So we pause there for a couple of months uh, and move into the new year of 78. The case of Menon Dubay back in Eastern Townships. Again, a child, 12 years old disappears um, and uh, a couple of months later she's found encased in ice um, uh, in just south of her home in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Back to Montreal now, um, but again there's a pause of several months. We, we wait until June 3rd, 78, and this is the case of Lise Amblay, the east end of Montreal. Uh, she's murdered while coming back from a disco. Um, um, bludgeoned and strangled in her backyard of her home where she lived with her parents. Um, another pause. We pause all through the summer of 78, and uh, it's not until November 3rd, 1978, 
that uh, my sister Teresa Lohr goes missing from the Eastern Township. She's later found five and a half months later uh, near her dorm residence. Um, cause of death at that time is undetermined. It later comes to be revealed that there is a coroner's document that says that the uh, coroner noticed marks of strangulation around her, her neck. We will skip the case of Maria Dolores Brava because police now say it's criminal negligence, but uh, let's throw it in anyway. Why not? Um, when have they ever been right? June 2nd, 79. Um, so again, a long pause. We're, we're, we're getting uh, breaks in the timeline here. And this unknown victim is found um, near the Dorval Airport in a dumpster. August 3rd, 79, is the case of uh, Nicole Goudreau. Again, she's attacked um, on the staircase of her, her home, dragged to a field where she's um, stabbed, strangled, raped, murdered, August 3rd, 79. And finally, what I called the coda. We, we started in Longay, we, um, or in, in, in Point Saint-Charles. We end in Point Saint-Charles. The case of Tammy Leakey, a uh, young 12-year-old girl, disappears from Point Saint Charles when she runs to get milk um, and candy bars. Um, and she's found about an hour and a half later, a um, 20 minute drive when Point Saint Charles near the Dorval Airport, March 12th, 1981, um, case of Tammy Leakey. To um, round out all the cases we've been discussing about for these past 17 episodes. Trying to put all this together, uh, what do I think? I think? I think geographically there's some interesting things to look at. As, as the first thing we, have, we, we ever talked about was uh, this Highway 112 uh, series of cases. Uh, and I, I don't want to put too strongly a point on that. I'm saying it, it, it if, if we're... If there is a connection between the Teresa Lord, Louise Cameron, uh, Helen Monast, Denise Bazinet, Sharon Pryor cases, if there is one, then I think what possibly links them and, and should be looked at is the travel corridor of Highway 112 and, and um, the unique characteristics of all those cases that may inform uh, why an offender may have been using that route at that time. So there's a cluster. There's a second cluster that we just talked about, these Laval cases that curiously all um, converge uh, in Cartierville. So linking uh, Tremblay with uh, Joanne de Rion, with, um, with Catherine Hawks possibly, and possibly somebody, um, uh, possibly using the commuting system of the subway and Metro to stalk people. Or not, who knows, possibly also could be someone with a vehicle. Certainly the case of, of uh, Chantel Tremblay makes it problematic uh, for somebody to leave their house, make it to the, uh, um, the Henri Barassa, I believe, a metro station, and then to be found all the way back where they originally started from is problematic and would suggest a vehicle. And then we have this uh, cluster of uh, East End cases, the, the Blay attack in her backyard, the, um, the disappearance of, of Bazinet um, from, from, her, uh, um, from where she lived in the East End, uh, Nikki Goudreau, um, the Choquette case, um, possibly uh, an offender li you know, living in the East End who came in, into contact with these women. And, and then we have, um, you know, the Leakey and the, the Sharon Pryor cases, which uh, could stand alone or, or could, be, could go in, in many, many directions. Uh, on the one hand, yes, I see Pryor possibly being associated with this Highway 112 case. Although, just in terms of level of violence, um, there's so much similar with Sharon Pryor and Jocelyn Houle, who was found in saint calix and and Louise Cameron Pryor, the, the 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 crime scene are very very similar in those cases, 
And and then Tammy Leakey, as I say, could, could be a one-off, could be a, an outlier, or could be connected, as some have suggested, to cases that came later, series of child abductions and murders in, in Montreal in the mid-'80s. Um, in terms of um, offender or, or crime site, um, uh, um, there's there's something interesting going on here. Uh, the cases of Alor Cameron... Dubay, uh, Bazinet, Pryor, Houle, Leakey, they all seem uh, organized. Uh, they all seem that there's a certain amount of methodical thinking going on there to actually possibly get someone into a vehicle um, through some sort of ruse uh, and to uh, abduct them. Um, in, in those cases, there's a, with the exception of Leakey, there's a significant amount of time that elapses between the disappearance and um, the, uh, the the discovery of the body. Um, and, and then I think again, I, I think, I don't know, recall if we talked about this, but um, the criminologist Michael Arntfield talks about, um, you know, in cases where where bodies are found outdoors in, in wooded areas, sometimes will suggest uh, a voyeuristic nature to the offender. Um, the idea that the offender had been um, watching and, and stalking the victim um, long before the event occurred and, and a, a possible uh, explanation for why the, the bodies are found in these places is because that's the locus that they feel most comfortable in. They feel comfortable um, watching from the trees or, or from secluded areas. And so when they come to to actually uh, committing the uh, the offense, it just feels natural uh, for them to to dump the victim in 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 these geographic regions. We also have certain cases um, where we wouldn't necessarily um, uh, come to the conclusion that it's um, a ruse off offense. The, the contact me method is through deception. Yeah, certainly in the cases of, uh, of Blay, who's attacked in her backyard, uh, possibly Monast, Hawks, um, uh, Dorian uh, Tremblay, possibly Leaky. It could be a blitz offense. That's something just, you know, it's a, it's a snatch and run kind of thing. Snatch and grab uh, happens very, very quickly. Um, in, in most of the cases I just talked about, the... the um, the bodies found in close proximity from where they disappeared. Uh, consider Monast, consider Dorian, consider Hawks, um, consider Blay. And, and that, that there's not a, possibly a disorganized offender that these things possibly, oh, and certainly throw into that the, the last case we talked about, um, Nicky Goudreau, again, very quickly a blitz, definitely in that case. Um, and this is a, possibly a dis disorganized offender who just um, acts on impulse. At, at the time, there's not a lot of premeditation behind it. It's not the idea of somebody stalking or, or premeditating um, how they're going to commit the offense. It happens very, very quickly. And, in, and certainly in some cases, it, it, there may be a, a variety of, of motives around it. Uh, again, very impulsive. There's there's a sexual uh, nature to it. There's there's the the compulsion to commit assault, but also petty theft. Uh, in the case of uh, Choquette's ring being uh, uh, being stolen, in the case of uh, Goudreau's uh, purse being emptied, um, there's also these 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 secondary um, activities going on. And then finally, you know, to add, to, to add to the confusion over how, how to categorize all these cases, we, we have um, um, the reality of police uh, jurisdiction and which agency was, um, had the authority for, for which of these crimes. So in the case of the SQ, we have Allure, Camera, Dubay, um, Monast, Houle. Tremblay. In the case of the Montreal police, we have Les Amblais. We have Catherine Hawks, although at one time that was a, a RCMP case. We uh, 
we uh, have, um, um, excuse me, Tammy Leakey. In the, in the case of uh, Laval, we have uh, Choquette, Dachyon, and then in the case of Longuet, we, um, we have the um, Joanne uh, Lemieux case, and, 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 of, and of course, we have uh, Sharon, uh, Sharon Pryor. Um, and as we've talked about for a long time here, um, uh, the nature that all of these cases, I would, after 40 years of atrophied, how could you not consider these as criminally, criminal investigative failures? And despite the, um, the lip service that agencies pay to the fact that they cooperate and they talk with each other, I don't, I don't see much evidence of that in any way. What does it matter anyway? The time for cooperation was the, the time of the event and, and the ensuing 48 hours, let alone 48 days. We're approaching 48 years in some cases here. So um, um, I certainly um, would encourage uh, cooperation this this late in the game, but uh, should have been done a, a, a lot sooner. Days of nothing, that's what it's like working cases. You're looking for narrative, establish a timeline, build a story, day after day. I'm going to switch gears here for um, a bit. Um, a couple of weeks ago, someone pointed out to me uh, that the Canadian federal government was uh, doing a job search. They're looking for a federal ombudsman for victims of crime. And did I have any interest <laughs> in applying for the job? Um, which um, I found quite preposterous. Um, I find um, I get more done working from the outside than, uh, and, and, and quite, quite literally from the outside being, being uh, in the United States, outside of Canada. I, I wield a certain amount of power by the fact that I'm not there, which is very advantageous. Um, and, and besides um, victims' issues at the national level, um, is is not really currently my my area of focus. My my focus is squarely on Quebec and um, and cold cases and cold cases have yet to be processed in any justice system. So they they sa they stand outside of um, the justice process. Um, so what advantage would it? be to me to become a federal ombudsman at, um, at the national level in Canada um, when that office has little to no influence on, on cold case issues. But a little, a little history of, of this office, there was a time I was quite um, involved in victims' issues at, at the national level. I'd say for about three to five years, um, I kind of got pulled in. Um, I got pulled in, I think we talked about this, uh, the uh, Justice Canada's um, Policy Center for Victims Issues, I believe it was in 2003, hosted a national conference, um, which they, <laughs> they called Lessons Learned from, from Victims of Crime. And uh, I tried to get on the agenda because I, I think at that time Teresa's case was 25 years old, and I said, "Hey, this is this is great. Why 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 don't you have me there?" And they they would have nothing to do with me. And in fact, I think I I scared them. Um, I was very naive at that time. They were telling me, "Well, Mr. Allure, we we have several NGOs there who will be representing your interests." To which I replied, "What's an NGO?" I, I really, I, I didn't know. I had no idea it was a non-government agency. Um, but that's kind of to the point. I quickly realized that this this conference where, where everyone was going to be learning from the lessons of crime victims um, had little to do with crime victims. In fact, few of us were invited to the table. 
or or those that were invited had sort of been had come in under the fold. You'll see this a lot. Victims get damaged through the the justice process. There's divorce, there's substance abuse, there's loss of employment, and the next thing they, they find themselves on their ass um, looking for opportunity, and the only thing that they know is their cause. God, it sounds like me. <laughs> it's not, it's not. So they, you know, so they turn then to the non-government agency systems, and in some way or other, they become a process handler. They involve, they get involved and in some cases, they do very, very good work, but I would argue that in some cases, some people become compromised. Um, so this, it, to my taste, this conference had an awful lot of that flavor for it. Um, a lot of uh, uh, bureaucrats, functionnaires, NGOs all getting together to talk about what they thought is, is best for the plight of victims. And yeah, I, I guess you don't want a whole lot of victims around the table. We can, as I, you, you can tell from what I just said, that we can be a, a, a feisty and or, ornery uh, lot. But nevertheless, this, this struck me as distasteful. So I attended the, the conference in protest. And when the first plenary was going on an opening day, I, I think I've told this story. I approached the microphone along with uh, Pierre Boisvenu who had just lost his daughter to murder. And we <clears throat> sort of said in French and English, she, you, don't, <laughs> you don't speak for victims. You don't speak for my sister. You don't speak for my daughter. And it was shortly thereafter that I was uh, approached by several people um, who wanted to bring me into the fold. Um, and so initially I thought this was really great. So that's how I sort of got first involved with um, with victims' issues at the national level. I was um, a founding member of AVPAD, which is a Quebec organization, Association, Association de Familles, uh, de, um, what is AVPAD? It's for murder victims and, and missing persons victims. Um, and then uh, I was involved um, in creating a new... Um, national victims organization called the Canadian Association for Victims Assistance, whose uh, acronym was CAVA, which, uh, which we should have, we should have come up with another uh, acronym or, you know, another name, I think. Uh, um, when people think CAVA, the first thing they think about is not victims. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> in, in fact, what CAVA is in the world of, of wine and spirits, I think we were the the exact opposite. We were something that would really you know, sober you up fast. Anyway, um, I think we were around um, for about two years, two conferences, one in Toronto um, and one in Vancouver, um, before we self-imploded and dissolved. And the, the reason we dissolved um, are the same reasons that in anything dissolves, but particularly in why the center cannot hold typically in, in Canada, is Ontario and Quebec and the West couldn't get along. We couldn't agree on anything. That, you know, I could talk about it a whole lot more, but that's really what it was. And couldn't sustain itself. <clears throat> and then and then for a while I was involved with NOVA, the National Organization for Victims Assistance. That's the National Organization for uh, Victims in the United States. I went to a couple of conferences. I am, um, uh, you know, I spoke or presented at a couple of conferences. But again, um, I quickly found the whole thing to be really, really um, distasteful. Again, not a whole lot of, uh, of victims, uh, a lot of NGOs. You know, and uh, I'm sure all of them and had the best intentions, but it was very clear that over the years um, they had kind of lost their way, I think, you know, and they were treating these conferences as, frankly, as just a, a junket, you know, and it's sort of like, oh, are, are we in Orlando this year or Anaheim? And, uh, you know, so, you know, 
certainly the daytime was filled with um, important seminars on, on victims' issues, but you know, every night there were dinners or riverboat cruises or trips to Disney World or Disneyland, and, and the whole thing left a, a really bad taste in my mouth. It wasn't anything I wanted to be associated with. Um, not that I'm some kind of Puritan or anything, but um, I, I just think the, the um, w whether you're doing something inappropriate or not, the, the appearance of impropriety is, uh, is um, what is key there. <clears throat> and I would never want to be um, representing victims of crime people who had experienced some of the, the most uh, horrible psychological trauma, um, you know, and the, the staying in a fancy hotel and eating a fancy meal. It's just not for me. So I quickly bagged off the whole um, victim carousel at that level. However, I, I, it, it is true that I was... Um, I was one of the, the first to lobby for a Canadian's uh, victim's ombudsman. It wasn't just me. There were several of us that we were looking for, you know, the, as I said, I mentioned this, this group under Justice Canada, the Policy Center for Victims Issues. And they were really, that group, a bunch of lawyers who were representing um, victims' issues. Not the friendliest of people, you know, you know very, um, very, very lawyerly and, and and so what we wanted was somebody who could be the face of uh, uh, for victims, um, a, a pit bull, somebody who could certainly challenge and represent our in interests, but somebody who who had some soft skills and 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 could um, really kind of rein in the interests of of, of all victimology in in Canada and and be the focal point of it at the national level. So in two thousand and seven, this this. Um, office was created and uh, a friend and associate of mine, Steve, was the first ombudsman. The office quickly became very, very political. Um, as soon as the conservative Harper government came into power, they, they turfed uh, uh, Steve from the office um, and put their own person in, 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 uh, in the position, uh, who was a former uh, police chief. Uh, which didn't sit very well with me. I didn't really want law enforcement representing victims' issues. But anyway, I, I, I frankly quickly lost interest with the office. It, as I said again, I, I, my interest was Quebec and cold cases, which did because you have not caught an offender, it, it has not yet touched the, the justice process. And I'll, I'll summarize currently what the mandate is of the of the ombudsman's office. Um, it's to promote access by victims to existing federal programs and services. It's to address complaints of victims about compliance with the provisions of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act that apply to victims of crime committed by federals under a or, or uh, offenders under a federal jurisdiction. It's to promote awareness of the needs and concerns of victims and the applicable laws and benefits victims of crime, uh, including to promote the principles set out in the um, Canadian Statement of Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime. Again, with respect to matters of federal jurisdiction among criminal justice personnel and policymakers. To identify and review emerging and systematic uh, issues, systemic issues, including those uh, issues related to programs and services, et cetera, et cetera. And to facilitate access by vic victims to existing federal programs and services by providing them with uh, information and uh, referrals. Now, if you don't know, uh, this week... Um, uh, Canada celebrated the 35th anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and for some people, that's a very good thing uh, uh, that we have that. And for some people, it doesn't go far enough and there still needs to be a, um, a lot of work. Um, <clears throat> along with that, uh, very recently, I believe 2015, um, Canada finally adopted uh, the Canadian uh, Victim Bill of Rights. 
which went a long way to to say that Canadian crime victims um, have certain basic uh, rights um, for their their cause that need to be recognized at the federal level. But for many, um, that um, Bill of Rights didn't go far enough, um, particularly in the um, in the shape of enforcement. Uh, a, a lot of advocates believe that it should have been the, the federal ombudsman who had the power uh, to enforce and, and take to the judicial level um, issues uh, of violation of the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> and uh, I'll give you one example, um, but there are several. Uh, one of the main contentions um, is plea bargaining. Uh, what of the case where a, a deal is cut with an offender in the judicial system, but the victim isn't involved in, in the, the negotiation or, or discussion? At a very um, conservative level, victims have argued they should at least be able to weigh in and consult on the matter. And others feel would like to take a, a step further and say they should have the, the final say in, in plea bargaining arbitration, which is certainly that's a little far to go that far. But certainly in the case where, where plea bar bargains are done um, and the victim isn't consulted, some believe that the ombudsman should should have had the power to be able to to to, to then act uh, as a as an enforcement arm of uh, the um, the justice minister in the Canadian government. Now, keep in mind, all of this, again, only touches the federal level. So if I were to give you, let's, let's have a very personal example. Um, an offender in prison comes forward and says, uh, I, I know what happened to Teresa Lohr. And I will tell you what happened if you'll grant me clemency in that case and other murders that, that I know about. Should not, you know, should not the victim, my family, be able to weigh in on that? And regardless of, of my feeling on that, whether my feeling was, you know, I can see two things. One take would be, I don't want to know what happened happened. Let them rot in prison. And the other take could be, yeah, I'm all for um, restorative justice. Yes, I, it's better to know. Let me know what happened and then grant them clemency. Well, of course, all of this does not fall under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms or the, the Victim Bill of Rights because we're talking about a provincial matter, Quebec prisons, Quebec justice system. Um, and as far as any of us can tell in, in these cases, the only, the only um, instances where that kind of scenario would apply at the federal level, I suppose, would be cases involving the RCMP or possibly some military um, cases. But, but any, uh, anything in the courts uh, you know, for just, just looking at my locus of interest, uh, murder, there is no Bill of Rights protecting them. And, and if you want one, um, you need it adopted um, for each province and each of the three territories. So that's that's just one example where, you know, looking at the mandates of the uh, the ombudsman of crime. The, the worry there, it, it you know, it seems pretty soft. You're you're to promote uh, awareness. Uh, you're, you're to make victims aware of programs. Uh, you you stay abreast of emerging issues. Uh, you know, more specifically, if uh, uh, inform the victim uh, of parole hearings, uh, provide them with the monetary um, uh, subsidy so that they can attend a parole uh, hearing, uh, allow them to uh, um, submit victim impact statements, these kind of things. Um, so you're the you're the spokesman, but some have. Um, some have questioned uh, the direction the ombudsman's office has gone in the last 10 years since uh, its initiation in 2007. 
where some wanted a, a pit bull. Um, some have argued that what they've ended up with is a, is a lap dog. Um, someone who uh, is, is, a, is a talking head and spokesman for victims' right, but, rights, but with, with not uh, a lot of uh, ability to, um, to impact and influence change in, in the justice areas that uh, would touch uh, victims of crime. Nevertheless, um, when I looked at the job description for the uh, federal ombudsman position, um, I found that I was uh, pretty pretty qualified for the position. Uh, my education experience, I have a master's in public administration with a, a concentration in justice administration. Um, they were looking for someone with significant um, finance and budget experience. Um, my 20-year career has been in budget and finance at the local government level. They were looking for somebody with significant experience in Canadian victim advocacy um, and, and clearly um, founding uh, CAVA and AFPAD or co-founding those, those, um, those organizations uh, would demonstrate that. I'm also currently the vice chair for a group called uh, LINK, which is long-term inmates now in the community. This is a project, um, well, it's, its foremost project is something called Emma's Acres, where they help former offenders and victims reintegrate into the community through um, farming practices. So I, I, I stay involved with that. That's located in Mission, British Columbia. Um, it, it, uh, it asked if I had significant experience uh, with government best practices. I do. My whole life I've worked in strategic planning, performance measurement and management priority and program-based budgeting and uh, multi-year financial planning. It asks for experience in the management of complaints functions and review functions or an investigative function. And I would cite that uh, my work at the local government level um, involves a significant amount of um, engagement with the community through processes um, such as public hearings and community meetings, charrettes, digital town hall meetings, um, uh, resident surveying, social media platforms, etc. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, I <clears throat> have applied for the position to be the Canadian Federal Ombudsman for victims of crime. It's a three-year appointment. I'd have to move to Ottawa. There are significant challenges and obstacles uh, to, um, to becoming the head of that position, but nevertheless, I thought... Why don't we start the process and then we'll uh, we'll confront those challenges when we confront them? For now, uh, the next step would be to get an interview. I don't even know if they will interview me. That's out of my hands right now. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I put my best case forward uh for being the best candidate for that position. And I will give it my very best effort should I get um, an interview. And then anything um, that might come of that afterwards in the process, um, I will consider at a time that I have to consider it. Leave you with one final uh, thought this time around. Yesterday, uh, a cousin of mine found a photograph of my sister that I long lost. Um, it's of um, her and uh, my brother. My brother's the girl on the right in the photo. <laughs> Give you an idea of when it was taken. Taken probably around uh, I'm guessing 74, something like that. And it, it appears to be a Christmas um, when we were visiting my family and we're 
they were all sitting around playing you know, like one of those games like from Ideal or um, I remember I can't remember what it's called, but it it, it was a spring loaded donkey. And you tried to put things on the donkey, like a bucket and, a, you know, a box and saddlebags. And eventually the the weight of the stuff became so heavy that the, the donkey would buck and all the stuff would go everywhere. Anyway, that's, that's what we're doing in that position. The, the kid in the middle, although it looks like me, is not me. It's actually my cousin. I always find it... Um, um, amazing when you find something like that uh, because it's it's like a piece of your memory was obliterated and then completely restored so some a picture or a narrative you, you thought you had suddenly hey pickle suddenly gets another piece that sort of informs it and, and gives you an yet another perspective on it it's just just like completely opens a door that before was just this darkness um it's a very very uh very powerful uh, memory so that is the podcast for this week um as always i will post photos, information, etc. related to this podcast on the website www.teresalor.com. I'm on the Twitter. I'm at Justice Guy. That's at J-U-S-T-U-S-G-U-Y. You can reach me that way. Um, as always, this has been Who Killed Teresa. I'm your host, John Allure, and have a great, great Saturday afternoon. Bye.